so you want to become a cloud engineer in 2025. But where should you begin? Well, I've been working in IT for about 30 years and I've spent the last 10 years at Microsoft as a cloud engineer. And if I had to start all over again, here's the five skill areas I'd focus on. Starting with the fundamentals. The operating system is a platform that we build everything else on top of. Windows, and I'll even throw in their Active Directory because that dominates in the corporate environment. But you should also know your way around Linux too because over 70% of the cloud uses it. Scripting is another great skill to automate your repetitive tasks. And that frees up your time to spend solving new problems or designing new solutions. In Linux, you'll spend most of your time over in Bash, but on the Windows side, you'll be in PowerShell. Virtualization is another foundational skill. It'll let you create multiple virtual computers inside a physical host server. And each one of those VMs will have its own operating system, applications, and runtime environment, just like a real computer. But another way to virtualize is with containers. That's where they share a common OS and then isolate the applications, which makes them lighter and more efficient than a VM, and they can be deployed almost anywhere with ease. And understanding those particular fundamentals will lay the foundation for how the cloud works, and you'll know everything that's going on under the covers. Oh, and by the way, I've released my new book, and you can dive deeper into Azure management, and that's linked in the video description. With your fundamentals down, the next major area is networking, which is the heart of the cloud. Cloud networks give you your own little private section of the cloud to run in. And it's kind of like Coke and Pepsi. They were working in the same office building, but they have isolated separate floors from each other. With virtual networks, you control the networking address space and how that space is subnetted. And that helps you to organize and to enhance the security of your traffic. You can also allow seamless communication between different networks with VNet peering. Another critical networking service is, of course, DNS, which resolves your domain names to your IP addresses, ensuring that all your services are easily accessible and you can communicate. And Azure, in particular, does have a strong hybrid cloud approach, interconnecting the cloud network with your on-premise network. Then there's multiple kinds of load balancers for both regional and global load balancing of all your kinds of traffic and that'll distribute the incoming load across the back-end servers. And that's what gives your workloads high availability and reliability. And the next key area goes right along with load balancing, and that's scaling. Scaling ensures that your workloads can adjust to meet your needs, and there's three basic kinds. Horizontal scaling is when you add more VMs or nodes behind your load balancer, and that way you can handle more incoming load. Think about it like running a website like Amazon.com during Prime Day or during the Christmas holiday shopping. Horizontal scaling spreads out the incoming load so that each individual node doesn't get too overloaded. But don't forget that it needs to go both ways because after the holidays, you need to scale down to reduce cost. Vertical scaling is when we change the capacity of the existing nodes. For example, when you add more CPU and RAM to a virtual machine. And that enables each individual node to do more or less as you need. And both of these scaling methods can be done manually or with a script, but in the cloud, you can also do something called auto scaling, which will automatically detect the needs of your workload to scale out or scale up. This is how services like Azure Kubernetes works or VM scale sets or Azure Virtual Desktop. But keep in mind, every application doesn't scale the same way. And scaling up or out is also going to increase your cost. So before you set up scaling, talk with your architects and with your business to know what the limits are so that things don't grow out of control. And then you should set up cost alerts and budgets to manage and monitor all of those expenses more effectively. The fourth area is controlling who can do what in your cloud environment. Your identities can be synced from your on-prem active directory into the cloud, or you could just start fresh and create cloud users directly. And then you can group them by their roles so that they're all easier to manage and set their permissions using identity and access management. So if you want app developers to manage their own environments or the sales team to upload files but not be able to delete them or 
keep your cloud architects in the sandbox and out of your production environment. You do all this with IAM. And getting this wrong can lead to everything from misconfigurations to hacks to worse. And we all know that the hackers aren't taking a vacation either. So you need to secure your identities using things like conditional access policies, multi-factor authentication, and pass keys. And the last major skill area for cloud engineers is probably one of the most important, and that's being able to write infrastructure as code. Now, I know I show you a whole lot of using the portal on this channel because a picture is really worth a thousand words, but it's going to take you hours and thousands of clicks to build an entire cloud environment, or you can just write it in code once. Automating with code will save you time, and it scales easily, and it enhances consistency and collaboration. Your code can even be stored in a version-controlled system, and then you can track your changes and collaborate with other engineers more effectively. It even allows you to roll back to previous versions of your code if needed, and you can control all of the deployments with a CI-CD pipeline. In fact, you should take your first step into learning your cloud engineering skills with Bicep right now, and happy learning.